Hey there, and thanks for watching. Over the next few minutes, I'm gonna walk you through my office development. Now, if you've used my industrial development model, most of this walkthrough will be a repeat because this model was built on the foundation of my industrial development model. And the great majority of the inputs, calculation modules, and outputs that have been built into this model come from my industrial development model. Now, if you're new to either an ACRE model or have never used uh, my industrial development model, then this walkthrough really is for you. And so over the next few minutes, I'm gonna talk you through how I would use this model to underwrite an, an office development opportunity. I'll share with you the various tabs that I've built into the model and help you get started. Now, as with all of our models, the first tab you'll find when you open a model is the version tab. Now, this tab is meant to First off, list any changes that have been made to the model since inception. This, of course, is the first walkthrough video of the Office Development Model, and so you'll find that this is version 1.0, the initial release. But the version you download may well have some changes, and you can find those changes in the change log. You'll also find some links to resources to help you with the model, the model's page itself, where you can go and download the most recent version of the model. You'll find our best practices in Real Estate Financial Modeling Guide, as well as a link to download some of the other models that we have on Adventures and CRE. Now, this model is built in a layout similar to many of the specialty models that I've been sharing over the last few years. Namely, we have a single underwriting tab where the great majority of your inputs go. 99% uh, of your inputs happen on this underwriting tab. Now, what you'll find is along the left-hand side, the first, call it eight columns or so, you'll have all of the inputs. Inputs are entered in blue font cells. Black font cells are outputs. You must change every blue font cell. Don't plan or expect to change a black font cell without possibly breaking the model. And so you'll see here along the left, we've got a lot of blue. Those are all inputs that you will change as part of your analysis. And then as you make changes to these blue font cells out here to the left, you'll see the impact of those change in the cash flows out here to the right in those black font cells. Now you'll also find that up and down in this tab, we have different sections. And to, to make it user friendly, I have tabs here at the top where you can quickly jump to a section. So for instance, Here's the description. We can jun jump then to the investment period cash flow section. This is where you model out the, your uses and sources of development, all right? Your construction budget, as well as the debt and equity used to cover uh, those construction cash flows. We then have our operating cash flow section. This is where our rents, income, expenses, capital expenditures all flow into the model, with the bottom line being either cash flow from operation if this is a merchant build or if we intend to hold long term, I can turn on my permanent debt module. You're also gonna have then some permanent debt service line and a resulting cash flow after financing line. That's our operating cash flow section. Then we move to the reversion cash flow section. This is where we model the sale or the value at the end of our analysis period of the asset that, that we intend to develop. Uh, Next, we have the return section, and this is where we roll up all of the property level cash flows and we calculate some returns. In this case, given its development, we're going to look at yield on cost and we'll compare that to market cap rate to get a development spread. We're also going to calculate equity multiple on an unlevered and a levered basis, internal rate of return, and a net profit, again, on an unlevered and a levered basis. That's our returns at the property level. And then we look at returns at the partnership level, right? So we take those property level cash flows, we flow them into a partnership waterfall, and we calculate the contributions from and distributions to the partners to the deal. In this particular model, we have the ability to, to have a GP and LP or a double promote where you have co-GPs who then go out and raise LP capital. And so you'll have a waterfall with the GP and the LP level, and then a waterfall at the co-GP level. So this again is the underwriting tab. We'll come back and talk through the specifics a bit more. At the very bottom though, you'll see now the sensitivity section, and this is where we can do some, some sensitivity analysis uh, to things like uh, maybe vacancy or exit cap rate, uh, expense growth or income growth. 
Now the outputs from, again, all of your inputs that are along this left-hand side of the underwriting tab either fall within the cash flows out here to the right, right? And then those roll up into some uh, grand metrics that help you make an investment decision. Now the, the most significant I've added into this frozen section at the top that is always visible as you scroll up and down, levered IRR, levered equity multiple, and then your development spread. All of that, together with the cash flows and the metrics, are summarized on a summary tab. Now within the summary tab, again, it has sections. You have some investment description where kind of salient facts about the investment, maybe a strengths and a weaknesses section that you would fill out. I've got a small section here where you can drop in a maybe a, a plan or a plat map or a, or a rendering. We then have the key assumptions and metrics section, uh, giving you, say, some of the key assumptions that are used in the analysis. Uh, we have a sources and a uses table. We've got a pro forma at stabilization as well as at sale. We've got some partnership returns, property level returns, some development specific return metrics, and then the outcomes from that sensitivity analysis that we did at the bottom of our underwriting tab. We also down here below have six charts. Uh, we have a chart that lays out the total project costs across the entire analysis period, as well as the equity and debt cash flows or our sources that cover our uses. Uh, we have some net operating income. So as the property is built and begins to lease up, you have negative net operating income. And then as it leases up over time, it hits stabilization. In this case, approximately month 30. And then because this is a long-term hold, I toggle this to a permanent hold, a build to core where we build, we lease up, we stabilize, and then we hold for a total analysis period of 10 years. You'll see that the net operating income largely is flat throughout the, the remainder of the hold. Then out here to the right, so just some summarized uh, return metrics, uh, both at the partnership level here as well as at the project level. So that's our summary tab. Now, another summary of the underwriting is in our annual cash flow report. And we can reveal that by default, it's hidden. We can click the show button and down here at the bottom, a new tab will appear annual cash flow. And this is just a roll up of the monthly cash flows that are shown or, or calculated on the underwriting tab. So we'll find again, our investment cash flows here is our operating cash flows. The reversion cash flows then flow into here our annual property level cash flows. Again, just a summary this uh, worksheet, the annual cash flows tab, as well as the summary worksheet, are both printable, uh, meaning they've already been set up so that you can print to uh, whatever report that you may use, either PDF. Or, or paper and, and you know, whatever format you intend to move or use those reports for. So again, those are, that's the general layout of functionality of the model. Now let's talk specifics in the underwriting tab. And again, if, if you've used any of our other development models and specifically the industrial development model, this will largely be a review. For those who are, who are new to these models, this will be helpful. So again, th this top section, blue inputs, these are just call it investment description items, things like investment name, location, your analysis begin date. That's the date at which you expect the project to begin. Uh, really, it's your first negative cash flow. It's the first outflow. Uh, so that may be the first dollar you spend in pursuit costs, or uh, there's a real possibility you're using this model to calculate from the moment that your LP partner enters the mix. That would be the moment where that, J, that joint venture closes. Uh, it may be the moment where you, as a, a venture, close on the land. There's, there's a variety of times where you might expect the analysis to begin depending on your situation. We then have the office building type, and I have a handful of typical office building types, core business district, CBD, uh, just kind of corporate office, like corporate campus, maybe some flex office or a live work office. There's some medical office and suburban. We then have the leasing strategy, right? An office development generally either falls within a speculative office, meaning you build without knowing exactly who 
it will fill the space or a build to suit. I recognize that there is a blend between that. Oftentimes you won't begin development until you've leased up a certain percentage of your space. I would still call that speculative if, if the entire building isn't built. Build to suit is a scenario where you're building a building specific to the needs of a given tenant. Um, so that's the leasing strategy. Uh, then we have land area uh, denoted in acres and then out here calculated in square feet. However, let's say you're in a jurisdiction that uses meters instead of square feet. You can come up here, toggle this down to meters squared. And while it still shows in acres here, uh, what really matters here is it tells you the land size in meters squared. Uh, let's bring this back to square feet. Uh, we also enter then the gross billable area. And then the net rentable area is calculated in the operating cash flow section in your rent roll. And you'll see that here in a minute. And the idea is you're going to compare your gross buildable to your net rentable. And that's going to tell you things like your efficiency ratio, right? What percentage of your building you're collecting rent on. Uh, we also have the number of stories uh, or the average number of stories if you have more than one building. In this case, I put one building, it's a two story building, uh, 72,000 square foot lot. And so the building covers roughly 42% of the land area. And the average floor plate of this office building is 18,000 square feet. Then we have parking inputs. So in this case, for instance, we enter the number of surface parking spaces, the number of structured parking spaces. The sum of that gives us 135 parking spaces and then it automatically calculates the number of spaces per thousand square feet of area. And so in this case, it's four and a half parking spaces per thousand. So that's the investment description section. Then we move to the investment period cash flow section. Again, this is where we're calculating the project costs and how they flow. Um, we call those uses of capital. And then we're going to model our sources of capital, the, the capital that we'll source in order to cover our uses. And so our uses are broken down into a, a couple different sections. Call this our construction budget or our project budget. We have land costs and then some line items under land costs. So in this case, I, I, I put land costs, closing costs, some miscellaneous item that I could add. I can add items to this section or I can delete items. So for instance, let's add um, and let's call this um, land improvement costs, right? Let's say that there's some cost that we want to include in the land. Uh, maybe we're bringing, uh, maybe it's off sites. Maybe we're, we're grading the land and we want to include that as additional cost. And then we would just add that out here to the right. Some number is our budget for that line item. And then we're going to model how those cash flows are spent over some period of time. So in this case, we're going to call this land, oops, excuse me, land purchase. Okay. And that's going to happen in time zero. And think of time zero as the moment immediately before your analysis begins. Um, it's essentially your, ve your very first period, your that first cash flow that goes out. And here I'm going to call that month zero. And then I, and, and there's a start to when the cash flow begins to be spent and there's an end. Uh, in the case of the land purchase, it starts in month zero and ends in month zero. And therefore the method which that cash flow is forecast out in the future, whether a straight line, S curve, steady growth, steady decline, or detailed is irrelevant. It all happens in the same period. And there's some value here. I'm going to say 575,000 is the cost of the land. Then we have some closing costs for that. And I'm going to say 3% of that amount is our closing costs. Uh, and let's call this closing plus due diligence. So we're going to spend some money due diligence here. And I, let's actually make this 25,000. Again, that all happens in time zero. Then we have this land improvement cost. And th that could, again, be a variety of things. Let's actually say it's 50,000 and it's going to happen over the first four months. So I'm going to start it in month one. I'm going to end in month four. 
And the method at which that will happen, rather, it, cannot, it can be straight line, which means the cash flow is identical in each of the periods. I could use an S-curve. In the case of an S-curve, it starts out slow, it builds up over time, and then it peters off at the end. It has a curve that follows a normal distribution curve. We can use a steady growth. A steady growth starts small and grows big, and it's the largest cash flow is in the last period. The inverse of that is the steady decline. It starts large and peters off over the end. Or we can use detail. And when we click detail, what will happen is out here to the right now, you'll see that these cells turn into input cells. And we could detail out the specific cash flow. So let's, in this case, say we're going to spend 25000 in month one, zero in month two, zero in month three, 15000 in month four, 10000 in month five. And you'll see that until we've entered an amount in all of these cells out to the right that equal 50,000, you get this incomplete error. As soon as we hit 50,000, it goes away. And that lets us know that we have modeled out here to the right in our cash flows an amount that's equal to our budget. So that's our land improvement cost. And the sum of that is our land costs. And it tells us the period over which those land costs are modeled. And it's the same in each of our subsequent sections. Hard costs, uh, let's say S-curve from month one through month 18. Uh, and let's say that our this is $250 per square foot. We have other hard costs, likely in an S-curve fashion. And then here I'm gonna put tenant improvements. And these tenant improvements are gonna happen near the end so I'm going to say in month 15 through month 18, I'm going to also, actually, I'm going to make this one a steady decline. And let's do um, the total, and what, what units is the amount of square feet. So uh, the total rentable area multiplied by, let's use $50 a foot, a million five. And again, it's, month 15 through 18, and you'll see that out here to the right now. It starts out large, 600,000, and then scales back to the end. So that is our tenant improvements. Then we move into soft costs, and it's a similar thing, architecture and engineering, maybe some construction management, marketing and leasing. Now the last line, you'll notice that this is a black font cell. I'm assuming that this line here, this row, will be the development fee. And so you would enter the amount of the development fee. Maybe it's preset 350,000, or maybe it's some percentage. Uh, in this case, let's say it's a percentage of hard costs. We'll go 4% of hard cost is our development fee. Whatever the method is that the development fee is calculated, you enter it there. And then this will automatically tell you the percentage of all of your, of your cost before financing that that number is. Um, so that's the development fee. The sum of all of those, land costs, hard costs, soft costs, gives us to a total project cost before financing. We then layer in our carry costs, and our carry cost is going to include capitalized construction interest. That means the construction interest that cannot be paid by operating income uh, is accrues to the loan balance, and that becomes a cost in your project. Then we have some financing fees. Maybe this is origination fee. Uh, what other fees? So I under some number there. Um, you can also model that over some. It's going to be straight line, um, but in this case, I'm going to say in month one. Actually, let's make it. Yeah, let's make it month one. We have a hundred thousand dollars in financing fees, and then we have an operating shortfall line. And this is similar to the capitalized construction interest, or in essence, these are operating expenses where there's not income to cover them, and therefore they become a shortfall that accrues to your loan balance and becomes a cost in your total project cost. And so again, we add in the total carry costs and that gets us to a total uses of capital. In this case, 11,856,974. Now we need an equal amount of capital to cover those costs in each of the periods out into the future. And that capital comes either in the form of equity or debt. This particular model can use two tranches or two forms of debt. 
And then again, multiple forms of equity, and that is calculated in your partnership waterfall at the very end, where you determine how, and we call it contributions of capital, or how that equity is split out between the, the various partners. But up here is where we model the actual construction debt. And that construction debt can be in the form of a construction loan. You can also, like I said, have a, sep a separate or a second form of construction debt. So let's say you have a, a mezzanine loan as well as a construction loan. And so first you would enter what percentage of your total sources are construction debt. So let's say 70%. And then it asks, okay, what percentage of the total is construction loan versus mezzanine. So let's say I'm gonna do a 60% construction loan, then I have this mezzanine loan. And then it asks, okay, how, does, how do those uh, two items fund, in what order? So for instance, we could have them fund what we call peri pursue at the same time. So we toggle mezzanine to one, and therefore they both uh, come out at the same time. Or I can make this two, in which case the mezzanine loan would fund after the construction loan. Now you may be asking, well, what if I want the mezzanine loan to fund first? You just, that's why these are blue out here. You simply reverse the order, make this construction loan. And now the mezzanine loan funds first. Now let's make this 10%. The construction loan funds second. And you'll see here the mezzanine loans 1.273 million, the construction loan 7.64 million. Out here to the right, you have the rates for, eight, for each. Um, I can either have it be a fixed rate. So let's say our construction loan is at 5% and our mezzanine loan is at 8%. Or I can use a variable rate. I click toggle this to variable and then out here to the right, you have inputs for your variable annualized rate in each of the periods. And then you can see here how your mezzanine versus construction actually fund. Remember how the mezzanine happens first the construction loan happens second. Again, we can toggle this back to Perry Passu, and now they happen at the same time. Now, equity will always go out first in this model. Debt comes out second, but you can toggle how the debt goes out, whether mezzanine first, construction second, or you may not have, you may not have mezzanine at all. So let's take this back. Let's just say it's a construction loan, and then you say construction loan 70, and we entirely turn that mezzanine loan off. It turns to zero, there's therefore no mezzanine debt. Um, take this back to fixed, make our rate a 5% rate, and um, there you've got your sources of capital. Uh, now we come in here and you can actually track the sources and specifically how they're modeled, the cash flows themselves. So remember the construction debt consists of your construction debt on, on the project before your reserves, your reserves are your interest and your operating shortfall. Then when you add in the interest reserve and the operating shortfall, you get your total construction debt. So you can get a sense of what proportion of your construction debt is used for actual improvements versus what's used for interest and for operating shortfall. The sum of equity and debt, 11,856, you'll note is identical to your total uses and that's key. Now, the final thing is because of the nature of construction interest and operating shortfall, uh, that there is an iterative logic involved in calculating those, meaning construction interest accrues to the loan and therefore you owe interest on top of interest. And as your interest grows, the operating shortfall or the amount of, of, of income that's available actually to cover operations might differ. Um, also how you model out your operating period cash flows and the speed at which you lease up and the speed at which your operating expenses grow will change your operating shortfall. And there is some iterative or circular logic to calculate both of those. And so, Rather than creating a circular reference and having to use Excel's iterative calc feature, which uh, is problematic, and I can get into that another time, we've created a macro in this model that will automatically calculate those. And you know when you need to run that macro, and that macro is essentially a small little tool in the back end that will automatically run that calculation. You'll know when you need to run it because there's a big red button here at the top, click to recalculate that appears.
That's essentially saying, hey, we need to recalculate interest reserve and operating shortfall. Click that. In the back end, it's running that calculation. What it's actually doing, if you're curious, is this cell right here. It's a black font cell, so you don't, you're not meant to change it. But you'll notice that this black font cell is actually a hard-coded value. What happens is that macro, how it runs, is it changes the value in that cell until the actual loan to cost is equal to your entered loan to cost. So for instance, I could change this to 75%. You'll notice this still says 70. Because they differ, it knows we need to run that macro. It runs it, and now notice this is 75% equals that loan to cost input. So that is our investment cash flow module. Now you'll notice that there's this option here to include permanent debt. In essence, at the end of your development period and once you hit stabilization, meaning you, you build, you lease up, the building has, has reached its, its potential, if you will, it's stabilized, you either will sell, in that case you would do no permanent debt, you would sell at that stage. We call that merchant build. Or you may want to hold, meaning you use construction debt, equity to get you to stabilization. And then rather than selling, you pay off the construction debt with some permanent loan. And that's what this module is here. So by default, the amount of the permanent debt, it will be equal to uh, what is needed to pay off the construction loan, inclusive of some loan fees. So here I'm going to say, okay, 1% loan fee plus closing cost. Actually, let's use one and a quarter. Um, the interest rate, permanent interest rate, we'll use four and a quarter. It is not an interest only loan. Uh, right now, the loan amount equals 81.7% of value and 76% of cost. That's not going to fly, but again, we haven't fully modeled our deal. Um, but based on our current assumptions that are in our, all of our dummy placeholder values until you go and change the re remaining blue font cells, this is what our permanent debt lo looks like. So I'm going to leave this as is. It automatically will calculate for you the amount you need to pay off. But this, again, is a blue font cell. You're going to update that as your underwriting changes. Now, you have a, a month when this loan funds. By default, it funds in your first stabilized month. But you can change that, right? So you could say, I'm going to fund... Um, so your first stabilized month is calculated here. I'm going to fund six months after that. And it, that will automatically change when that loan funds. And you'll notice the payoff of the construction debt is equal to your loan, your permanent loan funding date. Now, as I change that, it increases the length of our development period. And I have to recalculate, slightly adjust the interest reserve. Um, now, I'll come back to this here in a bit. We'll go to the operating period cash flows. Now, this is where you're going to enter the rent roll. You'll enter your recovery or your reimbursement assumptions. You'll enter your operating expense assumptions. The first thing you'll enter is the opera operation begin month. By default, it's the first month following your construction end. But let's say you had a multi-phase or let's say that you expected to begin collecting rent um, or incurring operating expenses prior to the end of construction or maybe after the end of the construction, you can update this operation begin month. It's a blue font cell, but by default, it's set to the month following your construction end. You also have some phase in of your property taxes. In the United States and many jur jurisdictions in the United States, your first year of operation, you would not pay the fully stabilized operating ex or property taxes. So in this context, it's okay, year one, 25% of stabilized, year two, 75%, year three, 100%. So those are your kind of global operating cash flow assumptions. We then move into your rental income. Now, because this is a development model, the operating cash flow module is fairly basic. It is you would model your first generation tenants. You have some lease start date. You have some rent start and at least start month. You have some rent start month. You have the square footage of each of your tenants, as well as the suite where that tenant is located. Um, now, right now, I'm assuming that three out of my four tenants, um, I already have tenants kind of uh, determined. I have three here that let's say I'm in 
I have signed LOIs from, and then I have this spec space that I haven't yet leased out. But I do have, what is that, 20 out of 30,000 rentable square feet fully at least committed. Uh, so I have my lease start, I have my rent start. I have some annual rent growth. So this would be the contractual rent changes. Again, because this operating expense module um, isn't overly complex, there isn't a market rent concept. Uh, it's assumed that your in place, your contract rent is market rent and that that grows at the same rate as market rent. And so let's say that we have uh, the spec tenant, I'm gonna grow at two and a half percent, my other tenants at 2%, and there's some rent. I'm gonna assume $30, 28, $30 and 28 for my tenants. Actually, let's assume that we can get the spec tenant at a sli slightly higher rate. Let's put them at 30 as well. And so then it tells us what our, our first uh, untrended year of rent is, but stabilized, it's 880,000 of rental income. Uh, we then have recovery income. Now this model, again, because it's basic, does not have another in, uh, does not have other income other than recovery income. And so if you wanted to add that, you'd need to add it under the office base rent, uh, uh, office based rental income. Now I do have a feature that I'm working on in a future version of the model that would add some other income. But for now, uh, it's just rent and recovery. And other, uh, under the recovery income, First, I'm gonna enter the status. So uh, these are signed LOI, and then the final tenant's a spec tenant. And then the question is, in what month does the tenant begin paying a reimbursement uh, to the landlord? I'm gonna say as of lease start, right? So I just simply uh, set these values and these values to be the same. Then the question is what percentage of the total operating expense that is attributable to that tenant or the, their pro rata share, what percentage do they pay? So in a triple net lease, I'm gonna assume 100%. If this was a, a gross lease, it would be 0%. Um, again, because this, this is a development model and the operating cash flow module doesn't need to be overly complex, I don't have the concept of modified gross or, or base year and so forth. We simply use the some recovery percentage concept. This is then is the total income that comes from recovery. And you'll notice because we're recovering 100% of operating expenses, 561, 768, it equals the total operating expenses that we're assuming for this uh, particular deal. Uh, so that is our, we get to potential gross income. We layer in some vacancy, uh, office vacancy and credit loss. And here I'm gonna assume seven and a half percent. And that depends on your market, depends on the property. Um, but in this case, I'm gonna say seven and a half percent, which is a pretty aggressive number, right? You'd often in office look at 10 or even 15% as stabilized. I'm gonna assume seven and a half percent. That gives me to, gets me to an effective gross revenue of 1.333 million. I then look at operating expenses. In a future version of the model, I intend to add more detail into my line items. But here for now, I just simply have CAM, common area maintenance, some management fee, insurance, and property taxes. We have the concept of fixed. Fixed is how the line item is influenced by occupancy. So if it's 100% fixed, that means that occupancy does not impact this line item at all. Or in other words, whether we're full or we're empty, you're always gonna spend on a stabilized basis 75,000 for insurance. In contrast, say common area maintenance, 300,000 in a year, 25% is fixed. So 75,000 of, th of this 300,000, we have to spend regardless of whether the building is 100% lease or 0% lease or something in between. But the other 75% is variable. And so as occupancy grows, that remaining 225,000 will increase uh, at proportionate to the occupancy in the building. So that's this concept of percent fixed. We also have an expense growth assumption for each of our line items. Uh, we have a percentage of EGR. And in this case here, um, 
Man, this is where we put management fee. So management fee is 3% of EGR. That's the expense. The other items are automatically calculated. Notice they're black font cells such that we get a 42% of EGR is the total expenses. That, that would be called our expense ratio or 561. We get a net operating income of 771. Now, the next thing we have is capital expenditures. And again, because I made this to be a fairly simple model, what I do is rather than having to forecast second generation and third generation leases, I have this concept of a leasing cost reserve. Uh, you enter some renewal probability, a typical lease term, some downtime and free rent, uh, tenant improvements, and your average office market rent. And you enter those values both for what would be a new lease versus a renewal lease and it automatically calculates some leasing reserve that then becomes an annual number that you would expect to spend on average over the entire hold period. Uh, that is a alternative to the idea of calculating uh, second generation and third generation leases, a, a really nice simple way, and I, I use that in, in my development models where I have long-term leases much more efficient. And I think you'll find that, that it, it's in most cases is sufficient for, for your needs here. We also have a CapEx reserve line, similar concept, rather than estimating when we might have capital, uh, capital expenditures out in the future that are not leasing costs, uh, we just simply use a reserve concept. Uh, and so in this case, I'm, I'm assuming $2 and 50 cents per square foot per year at $75,000 a year that we're reserving for things like paint, you know, exterior paint, maybe roof maintenance and repair, parking lot and so forth. We get a total capital expenditure per year. That gives us a cash flow from operation. Uh, now what's interesting, I should actually add as a value, that capital reserve is as a percentage of, oops, no, I do have it there. So right now the, the capital expenditure is 32% of NOI, that's pretty high. Um, I could probably take this down to maybe a dollar of 26%, it's still pretty high. Um, let's pare these down just a hair. So let's assume a 10 year term and 21%, now we're almost there and let's assume 3% renewal. Yeah, 20%, that's a pretty good number to use. A dollar a foot for, for CapEx reserves, a bit light, but um, this should this should suit us for a, a new building. So there we get now um, our cash flow from operations. We then because this is a permanent uh, build decor, we're going to hold long term. We have some debt service, uh, and we get then to a cash flow after financing. Now, if you're interested to in know the metrics on this debt service, we come back up here to here, and you'll see that that's a, a one five zero debt service coverage on NOI and an 886 debt yield on NOI um, based on the first stabilized month, actually starting in month 35, the first, the forward 12 months of NOI um, starting in month 35, that's your debt coverage, that's your debt yield. So now we move to reversion cash flow, right? So we got our investment cash flow, we have our operating cash flow, then we look at reversion cash flow. And this is essentially the value of the property at sale. So the first thing that it automatically cal calculates for us is your first stabilized year and some cap rate uh, based on a market cap rate today, today and some cap rate at reversion out in the future. So let's say that market cap rates for this type of office is five and a half. And then let's say, because it's, this is our terminal cap rate, 10 years from now, I'm gonna grow up by 50 basis points and it's gonna be a six cap out in the future. This will then first calculate the stabilized value and it estimates your cap rate at stabilization by taking a straight line from five and a half to six, calculating where we are in that straight line. And in this case, it's a five, six, two cap rate in month 28 you cap a 771 net operating income, and that gives you a stabilized value as of month 28 of 13.742 million. Now, you'll recall we built this 
for 11.753. So we created, if I come back down here, um, a couple million in value through our development. Now, going out to month 120 when we sell, this is our pro forma year, uh, our, our reversion pro forma. Notice these are blue font cells. By default, it automatically pulls in the forward 12 months from when we sell in month 120. But because they're blue font cells, the idea goes, okay, yeah, that may be what the forward 12 months is, but that, that's not necessarily what your next buyer will underwrite when they're calculating their purchase price, 15.2 million out in year 10. And so that's why these are blue font sales. It's meant to have you think a bit about your reversion pro forma. But here we get to valuation. We have our stabilized value. We have the value at sale out, out at the end of our analysis period. And then out here to the left, it shows you our equity proceeds from sale. Um, the sale price minus some selling costs. And the selling costs are up here in one of your inputs here, selling costs. Remember, here's our sale month. If you're curious about how you change when you're, you know, what's the end of your analysis period, you change it in that cell. But we take the, the gross sale proceeds, we subtract out some selling, pro, selling costs, we get net sale proceeds, we subtract out the loan, uh, permanent loan payoff, and we get equity proceeds from sale. Now, before we move on, we need to go back up and ensure that our loan our initial loan proceeds are appropriate. Now, after we made those inputs, we had, we modified the value. And you'll notice our assumption here, 8.877 million, that's now 65% of value. It's 75.5% of cost. In fact, the 8.877 million, that exactly pays off the debt. And that's 65% of value. That's about right. Uh, for a for a non IO or a fully amor or an amortizing loan amortizes over thirty years. Um, if we were to push this a bit, let's go to nine million in proceeds. That's now an eight seven four debt yield, a one five zero coverage, sixty five and a half percent of value. Let's go even higher. Let's take this to seventy percent of value. So I come down here to our stabilized value and I multiply it by point seven, and now we get nine six one. Nine seventy percent of value, eight one eight debt yield and a one four coverage. So let's say that our, our lender was willing to go to an a eight debt yield and they wanted at least a one three zero coverage. We do this at seventy percent loan to value. What's cool is uh, we actually took out some equity at that stage. We paid off the construction debt, which was eight point seven six six million, with a nine point six million dollar loan. We paid one hundred and 20,000 in loan fees. And the difference is uh, the um, equity payout. And we can actually see that happen. So I come down here to my net levered cash flow line. And I come to what was that month 30? There it is right there, month 34. You'll see that there's a $733,000 uh, proceed from the, the payoff. Um, and that was essentially a, and when you go into the partnership level cash flows, you'll see that it's a, a partial return of, of capital to the partners. So that gets us through our property level cash flows. Again, you can see the returns here in the property level cash flow return section, equity multiple IRR, yield on cost, uh, comparing that to our, our market cap rate. So in this case, we have st at stabilization, 95 basis point development spread. That's a, he that's a healthy development spread. Um, may or may not hit your threshold, but it's, it's healthy. Uh, and then we get into partnership cash flow. So we have our net levered cash flows at the property level. Those flow into the partnership. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, do we want to include the development fee in the GP's returns. We can either toggle that yes or no. If it's yes, it'll tell you, okay, that's 350,000, that's hitting the GP. Let's assume yes for, for fun. We then come down and we enter the name of the GP. I mean, we have GP partner and we have life co partner. And then it's what percentage of equity will be contributed by each. Let's say 5% from the GP, 95% from the LP, that's 150,000 from the GP and the remainder from the LP. We then have our waterfall. So we're gonna assume a 9% preferred return 
uh, and that's in, these are IRR hurdles, so a 9% internal rate of return. Now remember, in order to hit a 9% IRR, you must have a return of capital. So in this first tier, that is a return of capital and a 9% hurdle. There's no promote in that first tier. And the breakdown uh, is 95% is distributed to the LP, 5% to the GP. Um, then above the nine, we have some promote. So I'm gonna say a 10% promote to the GP to a 12, a 25% promote to a 15, and a 40% promote above. And then here to the right, it calculates the distribution to the LP and the GP. Because remember, how this works is the GP owns 5% of the partnership, the LP owns 95%. The partnership is the one that's promoted. Or, or in other words, the partnership is the one that's paying a promote to the GP. And so in this particular scenario, in the second tier from a nine to a 12, any cash flow above a nine, the 10% is paid to the GP as a promote. The remaining 90% is split 95-5, such that 15% of uh, the total cash flow is paid out to the GP. Um, yeah, what, so let me break that out. Yeah, 14.5% of the cash flow is paid out to the GP. 85.5% of the cash flow is distributed to the LP until the LP hits a 12, right? And then it's 28.75 to a 15 because there's a 25% promote, 25% to the GP, the remaining 75% is split 95.5, that's 28.75 and 71.25, and then in the final tier, 40% promote, that's 43.57. Uh, then you get a breakdown of the distributions between the GP and the LP, and then a breakout of the net cash flow to the GP and the LP. Now the IRR and the equity multiple are significant for the GP because we're including that development fee. If we take the development fee out, right, the development fee then is just a cost. Now you see the more appropriate breakout. Uh, again, it's an outsized share to the GP because they got into the promote, but it's 18% IRR to the GP and a 12, 3, 4 to the LP. Now, let's say that we had multiple GPs. I hit double promote. And what you'll see here is there's a summary of, of our returns. We've got our life co-partner, but instead of having just one GP partner, we actually have two. So this GP partner is actually made up of two parties, GP number one and GP number two. So let's say GP one, and let's call this the GP investors. This 5%, this 150,000 will be distributed. Let's say 20% comes from GP one, 80% comes from the GP investor. So the, the GP one, this is really the group that's leading the entire, the entire thing. They contribute 30,000 and they go out and they, they find maybe friends and family that put in 120,000. And then likewise, they're gonna have some waterfall, um, likely much much simpler. Uh, let's just say a 12% hurdle and everything's a 12, so I'll make all my levels 12, and above a 12, everything's going to be a 50% promote. And therefore, this GP investors, come down here and you'll see earns a 15.67% IRR, and the GP one earns a 26% IRR. And that is my office development model. Uh, feel free to let me know if you have any questions either in the comments or uh, feel free to shoot us a message. If you run into any bugs or there's features you'd like added, please also let us know. Again, this is the initial launch of the model version 1.0 and so there are undoubtedly things that need to be fixed and or new features that we wanna add. And yeah, ha have fun playing around with the model and appreciate your time.